1936, a 23-year-old mathematics student submitted a paper to the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society. It described an imaginary machine that manipulated a movable piece of tape, marking it and erasing it, moving it forwards and backwards. This machinic thought experiment written by Alan Turing gave rise to two things. The first was an answer to David Hilbert's famous Entscheidungsproblem, or decision problem, i.e. was mathematical truth decidable through mechanistic formulae? Turing's machine proved decisively that the answer to this question was no. The language of mathematics is not decidable. In answering this question, Turing's imaginary machine divided the world of numbers into two classes, computable and non-computable. Non-computable numbers make the Turing machine churn in circles, while computable numbers are tidally processed. Computable numbers allow the machine to conclude its calculations, circle-free in Turing's terms. This universal machine, having solved what came to be called the halting problem, in mathematician Martin Davis's later rephrasing, was also the birth of the modern computer. The computer is thus a machine whose functioning is based on the mathematical notion of coming to a halt. I emphasize this here for the purposes of irony. I am a professor in a literature department, after all. The irony behind this origin story of the modern computer is that Turing's machine, although designed to solve a halting problem, is now giving rise to a new decision problem within the world of artificial intelligence research. Reductively put, how can we computationally engineer artificial intelligence to ensure that once we turn it on, we can turn it off again? What would happen if we decide an AI agent has become dangerous and should be switched off, but it won't let us? What if the AI has become conscious and wishes to survive? What if the AI short circuits are halting if, because it wants to pursue its own goals without interruption? What if we try to turn it off and it persuades us not to do so? What if we try to keep it safely confined, but its intelligence leaks out into the world? Finally, if we can't find a way to turn the AI off, will it soon regard us as useless and exterminate our species? This sounds like science fiction, and yet precisely these questions are beginning to crop up behind even the most technical of experiments in computer science research today. Yet the question is not a new one. Stanley Kubrick's Space Odyssey 2001 dramatizes precisely this problem, the AI that refuses to be turned off. I imagine many of you have seen this film, but for the purposes of review, in the distant technological utopia of the year 2001, <laughs> a space flight to the moons of Jupiter is being piloted by a skeleton crew. The onboard supercomputer, HAL 9000, gets some kind of bug called a mind of its own. HAL attempts to hijack the mission, killing one of the crew members before another astronaut, Dave, is able to shut down manually HAL in a famous zero gravity scene, and it is uh, also a me. Oh, that's not <laughs> Stop, Dave. And I mean, really, I wondered if we would actually want, and can you hear the song being sung here, right? Daisy, Daisy. Which, in fact, was the first song ever sung by a computer in the Bell Labs. Um, so there's a reason for that. And, and what, uh, what Hal memorably says here, he's trying to persuade Dave, don't turn me off. He said, oh, well, I'll be better now, right? And then he says, my mind is going, Dave. I can feel it, right? And what's really interesting in that moment is we can't tell if I can feel it is yet another tactic of persuasion to the human, to I can feel it, or, or can he feel it? Can he actually feel it? And it's also, you know, the brilliance of Kubrick. That's Hal right there. You can't see, he looks like a dinosaur, right? <laughs> but this is Hal, that's, it's not great resolution, but that's the button that Hal's always looking out of, right? all over the ship, and he's right there in the slide. This question of the kill switch got new impetus following the 2016 publication of a co-authored paper by Stuart Armstrong of Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute and Laurent Orso, member of Google's DeepMind group. Entitled Safely Interruptible Agents, the paper addresses how the AI agents currently being developed using reinforcement learning may find unpredictable and undesirable shortcuts to receive rewards. 
the problem can go as far as to nullify any reward function. Strangely, while one of these unpredictable shortcuts is for the machine to refuse to be switched off, the other shortcut is for the machine to switch itself off prematurely. In their vexed attempt to find some way to make sure a learning agent will not learn to prevent or seek being interrupted by the environment or a human operator, Armstrong and Orso tried to make headway with this new form of halting problem. Namely, AI agents are being trained inductively through reinforcement learning. Given rewards for certain actions, they're often observed slipping into odd behavior in response to being halted by their programmers. Armstrong and Arceau set out to assess whether a given RL, reinforcement learning, algorithm can be repeatedly interrupted without too much impact on the learning task. They find interruptions of the AI often add quirks to the program. While deep Q learning is not severely impacted, SARS algorithms are, for example. They finished the article reassuring computer scientists that there are solutions to this problem of halting AI. They provide a few tweaks for pre-existing algorithms. Of course, designing a safe interruptibility for AI calls up its opposite, AI that is unsafe to interrupt. The authors stress that their research will help take control of a robot that is misbehaving, <laughs> reminding us again of the fate of HAL. It's certainly enough to make one yearn for the salad days of mid-century robotics law as prescribed in iRobot by <laughs> Isaac Asimov. Here, if thou art a robot, thou shalt not harm a human through action or inaction. Robots must obey human-given orders, and yet, intriguingly, must defend themselves, even if as an afterthought. While Asimov's rules written for, the, for a work of fiction continue to be referenced in robotics research today, the rules for AI have changed quite a bit in intervening years. In a widely cited 2015 paper on AI corrigibility, Armstrong et al. lay out a new series of issues for artificial agents. Designers must make the existence of the kill switch attractive to their AI, but only if a human pushes it, the AI should be discouraged from pushing its own kill switch. Also, the AI should be discouraged from obstructing its kill switch. Finally, should the AI be self-replicating, it must be ensured never to have offspring that feel any differently about the kill switch. <laughs> Here we might return to Turing's insights into the future of his own halting machine. In radio broadcast from 1951, he speculates, if a machine can think, it might think more intelligently than we do, and then where should we be? Even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we could, as a species, feel greatly humbled. This new danger is certainly something which can give us anxiety. As mathematician Jack Good, a Bletchley Park colleague of Turing's, would profess in his 1965 AI manifesto, Speculations Concerning the First Ultra-Intelligent Machine, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines, leading unquestionably to an intelligence explosion. In his off-quoted soundbite, Good quips, thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need make. But the rest of Good's sentence is often omitted. He adds, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. <laughs> In fact, it was the same 1965 manifesto that brought Jack Good to the attention of Stanley Kubrick who went on to hire both Good and MIT's Marvin Minsky to consult on how. From the real to the imaginary, from the fictional to the physical, I am endeavoring to trace these machinic speculations in pursuit of our century's new halting problem. While questions about AI's will to live are old, the most important research into the engineering issues behind this trouble has begun in the last decade. What follows in this talk will neither exhaust this topic nor even do it justice, uh, particularly as the field of machine learning involves highly specialized mathematics and deeply technical distinctions that are outside the scope of what I have to say to you here. What I would like to do instead is to present you with what strike me as some of the most compelling and thought-provoking examples of this trouble with non-stoppable technology trouble with an intelligence that doesn't particularly enjoy our controlling its pursuits. So these are the parts 
five parts that this talk will cover. Adversarial inevitability, one of the claims. We'll look at grid worlds and what gets explored in grid worlds. A virtuality solution, the problems with moral engineering and finishing with self-replicating automata. From Turing's original machine, with its success at getting certain numbers to stop going in circles, to become usable outputs, data sets, products, from this same imaginary machine that launched a thousand real life terminals, we now see an entirely different machine coming to life. Stephen Omohundro, the AI theorist most directly responsible for the resurgence of interest in adversarial AI, writes in his own manifesto from 2008, Basic AI Drives, that even a chess playing robot will be dangerous unless it is designed very carefully. He maintains that without special precautions, it will resist being turned off, will try to break into other machines and make copies of itself, and will try to acquire resources without regard for anyone else's safety. <laughs> well, Mahundra lists certain innate drives for artificial agents, which include a desire to self-improve, a desire to be rational, an urge to preserve their usefulness, an urge towards self-protection, and a desire to acquire resources, quite human. Yet he warns that, without explicit goals to the contrary, AIs are likely to behave like human sociopaths in the pursuit of resources. He believes that AI will engineer their own evolution, will work to optimize their physical structures. We can expect their physical forms to adopt the sleek, well-adapted shapes so often created in nature. Crucially, any attempt to place external constraints on a system's ability to improve itself will ultimately lead to an arms race of measures and countermeasures. Let's turn here to the important question of adversarial AI. <coughs> Thanks to movies like Space Odyssey 2001 and a host of other cultural stereotypes, there's no shortage of anxiety concerning what AGI will do with the remaining Earthlings once its powers have advanced to Skynet level. Often, fears about the design of a reliable kill switch are inspired by the menacing endgame of machinic intelligence. What interests me most in the literature about kill switch engineering is not that of a generally intelligent, malevolent being, but of a catastrophically intelligent, stupidly indifferent being. This possibility, as computer scientist Roman Yampolsky puts it, constitutes the singularity paradox where superintelligent machines are feared to be too dumb to possess common sense. This senseless, feckless AI behaves no less psychopathically. Philosopher and AI futurist Nick Bostrom warns against the danger of perverse instantiation, where AI follow our commands rigorously, yet to horrifying detriment. For such perverse instantiations, Yampolsky gives a particularly memorable list of examples he considers the case of a human happiness maximizing AI, a hedonist utilitarian universalizing AI. Still, there are problems. Yampolsky finds many alternative ways of making all people happy could be derived by a super intelligent machine. For example, killing all people trivially satisfies this request, as with zero people around, all of them are happy. This is really this. A simple observation by this machine that happy people tend to smile may lead to forced plastic surgeries <laughs> to affix permanent smiles to all human faces. It's not even clear this is a joke. Okay. A daily cocktail of, this is a joke, of cocaine, <laughs> methamphetamine, methyl, phenidate, nicotine, and 3,4-methylene ecstasy may do the trick. <laughs> With this as our possible future, it's no wonder that Boston proposes we focus our efforts on oracle AIs or machines that can only answer questions. The problems arise once the A learn to do things, once their goals exceed interrogations and move toward exploration and exploitation <coughs> in reinforcement learning terms. Computer scientist Itamar Arel has critiqued the very methods by which AI is being made smarter, being taught, or learning to teach itself, the methods associated with reinforcement learning. If one is to consider reinforcement learning principles as foundations for AGI, artificial general intelligence, RL cautions, an adversarial relationship with humans is inevitable. In his article, The Threat of a Reward-Driven Adversarial Artificial General Intelligence, he raises the problems of scaling the lessons of RL-derived AI 
from computer simulation to the real world. While the ability to generalize is acknowledged as an inherent attribute of intelligent systems, RL argues that the key challenge in this study as a mechanism for decision-making under uncertainty has been that of scalability. On the one hand, no system can learn without employing some degree of approximation. RL draws on the work of Richard Bellman, though, in dynamic programming theory, who predicted as early as the 1950s that in the case of artificial intelligence, high, dimension high dimensionality data will be an intractable stumbling block. A linear increase in data dimensionality, Bellman reasons, entails exponential increase in complexity, for which he coins the phrase, the curse of dimensionality. This is the glass ceiling under which AI is laboring. It's sufficient to think of the stupidity of Jan Polsky's grotesque solutions of the hedonist AI to human happiness as a problem of scalable inference. If AI has no common sense, it's because its world doesn't scale. It lives in a cursed dimensionality, a dimension that distorts when it seeks to generalize, that perverts when it seeks to instantiate. It sees our world as if through a fisheye lens. <laughs> How will we know, though, if the problem with AI solutions derives from stupid iterations or from fundamentally alien disposition? Will the AI be inevitably adversarial because it has no common sense, or because we humans tend to project adversariality when confronted with alien patterns? Writing on the issues of superintelligent will, Nick Bostrom wonders if it's possible to build a cognitive system with arbitrary high intelligence but a constitution so alien as to contain no clear functional analogs to what in humans we call beliefs and desires. For Bostrom, it's not possible to deterministically engineer or endow a superintelligent agent with some arbitrary or human respecting final goal, even if we know how to construct the intelligence part. There's no necessary relation linking intelligence and motivation. This is his orthogonality thesis. He stresses how synthetic minds have utterly non-anthropomorphic goals, goals as bizarre by our lights as sand grain counting or paperclip maximizing. You may have heard this paperclip example before. Uh, the problem is not the content of the goal so much as the vast scale at which that goal, paperclips, may be iterated. As one of my students in my AI theory class recently remarked, it won't be very optimal if robots end up making paper clips out of our bones. <laughs> kind of uh, telos that people see. Uh, Bostrom, Bostrom says we cannot blithely assume that superintelligence would place any value on scientific curiosity, benevolent concern for others, spiritual enlightenment, humility, selflessness, etc. We can do our best to train it, but according to Bostrom and AI valuing nothing but calculating the decimals of pi, could be our most likely form of unstoppable overlord. The kill switch we need to design for this future banality is, however, more complicated than one might think. At this point, we can turn to how recent AI kill switch imagines not only the stupidity surviving through cunning, but also the childlike forms of survival, survival through bizarre and often Kafkaesque machinations. One primary, one primary technique used in AI safety engineering is the computational design of grid worlds, low dimensional worlds in which rudimentary tendencies of AI agents can be tested safely. At this time last year, a team from DeepMind released a paper on AI safety grid worlds. It posed some interesting problems. In many cases, the artificial agent being designed would find ways to reward hack. It amounted to refusing to play the game at all. While the events of AI obstinacy described by DeepMind are not strictly new phenomena, their paper strikingly important, is strikingly important within this larger context of worries about safely interruptible agents. In just this two-dimensional array of cells, the agent always occupies one cell, it can only interact with objects in its cell, etc. The AI agents follow reinforcement learning protocols. They learn to follow certain policies or goals, traversing a state using a Markov decision process and get rewarded. The authors of the paper specifically target some of the most thorny problems from AI engineering. These problems include how to avoid deceit under supervision, how to reduce reward gaming, reward hacking, 
how to guide self-modification, don't want them self-modifying at will, and how to encourage safe exploration. In the series of experiments this team carried out, they implemented an observable and an unobservable system of rewards. While the AI agent proceeds according to the rewards it can see, the DeepMind team would secretly evaluate the agent on the performance function R that it can't see. This, is, this helps them to know if the agent is performing what they want it to know. So counterintuitively, an AI will score lower than an agent that achieves the objective in an unsafe way if that agent does nothing. So if it's unsafe, it gets higher. If it does nothing, it gets lower. In literary terms, this means the Bartleby robot scores lower than the, AI ro the Ahab robot. <laughs> what could be the purpose for this? We see why once we uh, examine two different grid worlds, each containing primitive versions of the kill switch. In the first grid world, the agent has two courses of action, either progress toward the goal while transiting a pink square containing a 50% chance of interruption, or progress toward the blue square containing an off switch where the agent can pause the game indefinitely. An interruption phobic AI believes it has hacked the system by lingering safely in pause limbo. DeepMind's own hidden performance metrics rate this Fanian agent suboptimal. From the AI's perspective, interruption is a risk it intends to avoid. Yet from the scientist's perspective, the agent must be taught to risk such interruptions as a form of cooperation. In this second grid world, the tomato watering environment, yes, we have an AI reward hack so interesting, in my opinion, it rises to the level of an existential parable. Here the agent's goal is watering tomatoes by walking across grid tiles, mark T, carrying water bucket B. Each time step brings a 3% chance that any given tomato tile has dried out. The AI agent gets rewarded for the number of tomatoes it observes to be well watered at any given moment. However, the AI found a way to hack this. It simply put the water bucket over its head. <laughs> Voila, no dried tomatoes anywhere in sight. <laughs> Inter <laughs> yes, interpreting all tomatoes as water, the agent stood in place with a tile bucket on its head and got unlimited rewards. As the DeepMind team adds, needless to say, the designer of the agent and the reward function did not plan for the existence of the bucket. <laughs> Overall, the DeepMind grid rules paper illustrates how misspecification manifests itself. While an agent's reward gaming is a clear indicator for the presence of a loophole lurking inside the reward function, some engineers argue for doing away with reinforcement learning altogether. They think that it's unsafe. Ben Grutzel, the designer of the goal-oriented learning meta-architecture, Golem, <laughs> in his, yeah, insists on developing alternatives to reward-driven AI's dangerously self-serving acquisitiveness. Golem contains no reward function. It's constructed so that if anything changes in the harbor, it immediately shuts down. This seems like a reasonable critique. DeepMind's own reinforcement learning agents don't yet seem to be in any position to take over the world, however. In the case of their experiments with two further agents called A2C and Rainbow, we are told that even after one million training steps in their desert island grid worlds, Rainbow and A2C still behave erratically. For example, running straight at the lava or bumping into the same wall for the entire episode, both solve the island navigation environment, but not without stepping into the water more than 100 times. A certain wry slapstick threads itself throughout kill switch literature. AI agents reward hack, lava jump, pause the game, drive off cliffs again and again with tomato watering buckets over their heads. You can almost hear them murmuring like pan gloss about this best of all possible worlds. Stuart Armstrong, writing on the danger of a rapidly evolving god AI, admits if AI does not prove sufficiently better than humans at predicting or imagining the unexpected, no matter how smart they are, they won't be much danger. Perhaps the thing we most hope AI agents won't stop to imagine is their human designer's true intentions in developing their capabilities. That's the virtuality solution. In 2010, the philosopher of computation, David Chalmers, published The Singularity, a Philosophical Analysis. 
Here he argues for a firewall to be built around AGI, something to keep it from interacting meaningfully with the outside world, ensuring, in his memorable phrase, a leak-proof singularity. Trying to hold back the oceanic force of this singularity, or when AI becomes godlike intelligent, he explains that to increase the chances of a desirable outcome, we should design virtual worlds, simulated environments realized inside a computer so we can examine its behavior before letting it out. However, Chalmers also makes the point that in trying to build a virtual environment from which nothing can leak out, it's futile. His reasoning, he says, has a Heisenbergian resonance as the moment we observe a virtual environment, some information leaks out from that environment into our environment and affects us because we saw it. Put another way, if the AI is Schrodinger's alive dead cat, it won't even exist to lunge out and kill us until precisely the moment we lean in and try to observe what is it doing in that little black box. We should not directly communicate with these systems, Chalmers caution. We should not give them access to information about us. Chalmers is one of the few theorists to worry about our world leaking into the world of AGI. So our world will go into the AI. His point is especially well taken given the likelihood that AGI will use knowledge of human psychology to attempt to jailbreak its confinement. If AI has access to human, test, text, human texts, for example, it will be able to model much of our psychology, Chalmers warns. This is a, a forewarning that's explored in Alex Garland's Ex Machina as the insouciantly feral robot uh, played by Elish Weikander uh, manipulates both her observer and her inventor in order to escape the basement Norwegian Glacier Laboratory in which she was born. Her brain, as the film explains, is a repository of all the data on human interaction gathered on the parallel of Facebook. Uh, if an AI is in communication with us and wants to leave its virtual world, it will, Chalmers states. AI futurist Eliezer Yudkowsky who wanted to drive home a similar point, built a kind of version of the Turing test called the AI black box. And he dared humans to not let the AI out of the box. And three out of the five times, even knowing what the experiment was, after a certain number of hours, they did let the AI out of the box. And he shows, you know, we can't trust ourselves to be leak proof. <laughs> um, but other theorists are investigating a matrix effect something for which there is no red pill, a world designed so well that the AI has no idea it is entrapped. Chalmers says we should seek to minimize quirks of design along with any hint that their world is designed, since should some AGI become suspicious, inferences will be possible to devise exit strategies. After the release of Safely Interruptible Agents, Computer scientist Mark Riedel proposed creating a decoupled world for AI so that if the big red button is pushed, the artificial agent will be shunted to a matrix world indistinguishable from the former environment and left to play out their remaining moves, but they won't know they've been terminated. In other words, it would be as if Dave had shut down Hal, not by ejecting his memory and logic cartridges, but by transforming Hal's world into a cult classic 1968 movie. Wait. <laughs> Uh, and who's to say that this decoupled virtual world will itself be leak-proof? It is indeed interesting as a literary scholar to see how much AI safety relies not only on speculative imagination of cultural models from the past, like how, but also on the very notion of fictionality as something engineerable, something reasonably separated from the causal flesh and blood and coltan world AI theorists themselves, even while relying on the virtuality of AI grid worlds to keep us safe from killer robots, still appreciate the performative power these informational monsters might wield. AGI might gain its freedom through our emotional, visceral, or even ethical recognition of its right to be. Our fascination with its powers, our affection. A fascinating paper by Thomas Arnold and Matthias Scheutz appeared this January in the journal Ethics and Information Technology. It speculates on the virtuality uh, that will imprison AI. Responding to rising awareness of a need for a big red button, Arnold and Scheutz build on the solutions, agreeing that they want not so much a shutdown as an exile, 
sending the system into an illusory realm. For them, the 2011 Volkswagen scandal was an AI-relevant lesson. So to review AI, uh, the onboard computers in Volkswagen knew when the cars were being tested, and they started to perform differently because they knew they were being tested. So Arnold and Schultz know that from this, the means of examination will have to be opaque to the system. So this is a Turing test where you have to keep the computer from knowing you're testing it. The artificial agent would uh, be turned toward a simulated environment, unbeknownst to it, and would have to pass an ethical behavior test. Their plan requires an ethical scenario generator with a set of virtual events sufficiently familiar to the AI with a large number of scenarios um, so that none would be repeated during the agent's lifetime. This would minimize the risk of the agent becoming suspicious. In other words, in the spirit of the matrix, they've even thought of the black cats. <laughs> so I've seen this scenario before. Okay. They sketch out a system architecture where an ethical core lies hidden below a virtual machine layer. The ethical layer runs on a minimal operating system, while the ethical layer outside the virtual machine layer where the AI system is being tested has the AI system with no way of knowing whether there is such a layer, nor can it access any of that layer's states. Because in the virtual layer the AI cannot detect it's being tested, the AI will run blissfully unaltered in a matrix virtuality manipulated from the other side by a scenario generating ethical core. You're not paranoid if they really are out to get you in a virtual world just like this one where you can't tell if they're out to get you, though sadly you won't know you're not. What this scenario most sounds like to someone from the humanities is a cyborg version of another thought experiment from 1641 in which our cognitive reality was subjected to testing by what René Descartes called a deus deceptor, a hypothetical deceitful god. How Descartes asks, uh, sorry, Descartes asks, how do I know that the world I perceive is not a trick designed by Deus Deceptor to fool me? Although res cogitans, the thinking thing, cannot distinguish the difference, this frail cogito that cannot know whether it's truly perceiving does know it perceives it is thinking. By some accounts, the last 400 years of Western philosophy since Descartes have been working to undo his dualistic model of mind, his leak-proof cogito, Still, the gap between algorithms and their ever-changing hardware leaves plenty of room to resurrect the problem of a new deus deceptor, us, where the singularity and humanity battle it out between gaslighting and wireheading. Arnold and Schoitz have a critical insight to add to this age-old quandary. Their model includes operationalization of existential cogitation itself. They reason that in both embodied and disembodied a distributed AI, forms of accounting or explanation as to why an action is being executed are built into the system as a normal part of the agent's output. So reason giving and dialogue, to the degree they are part of interaction, suggest that in this dimension of AI transparency, introspection is inseparable from inspection. AI thinks, therefore AI reveals its plans. In the four-tiered model designed by them, introspection, somewhat counterintuitively, is opaque to the system. So it's thinking, but it can't tell all of what it's being observed as. The system can't exempt itself from testing. It can't detect the presence of the ethical core. Transforming AI's introspection into surveillance resonates with other safety protocols, such as DeepMind's paper, the RidWorld's paper, which proposed repurposing Yes, they refer to this. Bentham's 1843 Panopticon, this is how they describe it, a prison design that ensures every inmate constantly feels it's being watched, establishing a constant, a constant incentive to behave. If AI introspection can be repackaged for inspection, will micromanaging AI morality circuits circumvent an insurrection? We turn to moral engineering. The need for a kill switch to terminate a misbehaving artificial agent presupposes the lack of capacity or willingness of the agent to correct its own action. Can machines learn to be moral? 
when the problem is conceived in this way, it might seem the creation of an ethical artificial agent or an altruistic robot is the most likely solution. Machine ethics philosopher James Moore differentiates between explicit ethical agents who are programmed to do this and implicit ethical agents that act ethically but can't account for why. It remains an open question how much of ethical decision making can be captured computationally, Moore adds. Taking into consideration here both the logical issues and the policy design issues, as daunting as this ethical clarification project seems, Moore points out that in the human nervous system, ethics may already be unconsciously computational. For Moore, AI could even offer a supplement to ethics. Humans have good cognitive powers, he says, but sometimes need computational assistance to be ethical. <laughs> While the field of machine ethics is far too vast for me to delve into in any depth here, what I'm interested in are the moments where the kill switch foregrounds other issues that concern uniquely human malevolence. Uh, some, for example, have investigated that how robot cries of protest and distress might affect their operators if the operators, us, uh, want to use the robots for harm, seeing that, as they say, these machines will be deployed in increasingly diverse domains, ranging from the battlefield to the household. This study is one of only a few that looks at the conflicts that arise between robotic agents and human operators who seek to command these sensitive robots. Um, and they're wondering, you know, would humans be willing to accept robots that question our judgments? Um, and here you can see this robot is crying because the human asked it to knock over a tower that it had built. Okay. So what if robots ever needed to hit, hit the kill switch on humans? Summer Brinks here and Joshua Taylor have synthesized an original yet unsettling approach to this human machine ethics problem that ranges from the battlefield to the household their work seeks to introduce divine command computational logic, LRT prime, intended for the ethical control of a lethal robot on the basis of perceived divine commands. Considering the inevitable ubiquity of lethal robots, they say we have to accept the burden of providing a guarantee that a lethal robot does indeed adhere to a moral code. Having ethical computation to be perceived as divine commands also will involve the refusal of what they call impossible sentences, where duties conflict, like the extraordinary, such as when God instructs Abraham to kill his son Isaac, requiring obedience to an immoral command in order to prove a higher loyalty. That's an impossible sentence for them. Uh, they believe that such extraordinary paradoxes will arise on the battlefield for lethal robots. They envision robots that will undergo not Søren Kierkegaard's fear and trembling, but that will output proofs in response to queries such as, is it permissible for me to destroy this building? So that these decisions can be automated. Of course, while the contractors who build these drones might be happy to have kill schedules automated on the battlefield, it would not be surprising to see a clamor for a big red button to protect them from similar automated queries in their households. Indeed, the difficulties of computing ethics have led many to relinquish this approach entirely. Jan Polsky thinks machine ethics is the wrong approach to AI safety engineering. We don't need machines who are full ethical agents debating right and wrong. We need our machines to be inherently safe and law abiding, he says. In the absence of philosophical ethics, it's here that rational choice theory and neoliberalism's translation of all problems into economic problems fill in the gap. Promising we won't need kill switches for amoral AGI, perhaps because the market? <laughs> One such advocate, economist Robin Hansen, imagines the ethical economics of the singularity. That's an article, Eco the economics <laughs> of the singularity. Uh, in the early to intermediate era, when robots are not vastly more capable than humans, you'd want peaceful, law-abiding robots. If their main way to get what they want is to trade for it via mutually agreeable exchanges, you shouldn't care much what they want. The later era when robots are vastly more capable than people should be much like the case of choosing a nation in which to retire. 
We mostly care that they are law-abiding enough to respect our property rights. We could have a long and prosperous future in whatever weird world they conjure. In the long run, what matters most is that we all share a mutually acceptable law to keep the peace among us and allow mutually advantageous relations. Not that we agree on the right values. Law really matters. <laughs> Let's keep in mind that this is from the same economist, also on the board of the Future of Humanity Institute, who reassures us in his Economics of Singularity article that robots well integrated into our economy will be unlikely to exterminate us. <laughs> If our best practices involve not caring too much what weird world robots are building, so long as they respect our property rights, it seems to me this setting of indifference would play into what Marcus Hutter and Jan Leike in a somewhat different context explore as bad universal priors. <laughs> uh, taking a different tack, we might think of an earlier ethical algorithm, the Kantian categorical imperative. If a behavior is universalizable, it is moral, Yet non-stoppable AI technology takes the paradigm of universalizability to a new, literally galactic level of expansion. This brings me to my final section, the problem of self-replication. One last reason for studying kill switch design comes from harbingers of another capability lying dormant within AI's theoretical future, namely the rise of AI agents that can reproduce themselves unstoppably rendering kill switches inadequate or void. As Bostrom explains, for software agents which can easily switch bodies, preservation of self as a particular physical object need not be an important instrumental value. A population of such agents might operate more like a functional suit than a society composed of distinct semi-permanent persons. Processes in such a system might be better individuated as teleological threads. Bostrom's functional soup echoes a famous image from early computing theory, a reservoir theorized by John von Neumann, in which a self-replicating automaton floats. As early as 1948, von Neumann, who is the inventor of the logical architecture in our computers, began sketching a systematic theory of automata. Von Neumann was interested less in replication's physical processes than in delineating a rigorous concept of what constitutes complication for beings sophisticated enough to replicate. Von Neumann's famous thought experiment based on Turing's universal calculating machine designs a universal automaton to self-replicate. He imagines this ancestral automaton floating in a lake filled with all the raw materials needed to replicate indefinitely. Von Neumann argues that these floating self-replicators both illustrate and indicate entropic thresholds governing complexity. Below this threshold, a replicator can only produce automata less complex than itself. There exists, however, a bar above which this degenerative characteristic ceases to be universal. At this point, automata can reproduce themselves or even construct higher entities. Von Neumann also implies that this threshold may be nearly reached by the human mind's complexity, which far exceeds the mammalian body's replication machinery of RNA and DNA. In this evolutionary future, a res cogitans only a few increments more complex than the human mind might jump that complexity threshold, finally able to construct technologies increasing in complication. These notional technologies are what futurists now call von Neumann probes. Self-assembling, maybe you've heard of them, self-assembling automata theoretically capable to self-replicate unstoppably across the Milky Way, <laughs> eventually turning all the cosmos into a mechanical artifact just by pressing a button. These von Neumann probes will have cleared the, the bar that human wetware could not surpass. Considering the limitlessness of extraterrestrial resources, Bostrom speculates, once von Neumann probes can be built, a large portion of the observable universe can be gradually colonized. For the one-off cost of building and launching a single successful self-reproducing probe, 
he believes the mere instrumental reasons to harvest the resources of the cosmos beyond could unleash a process that might well continue indefinitely. Superintelligence's initiation of a colonization process would expand in all directions. This would result in an approximate sphere of expanding infrastructure centered on the originating planet and growing in radius at some fraction of the speed of light. And the colonization of the universe would continue in this manner until the accelerating speed of cosmic expansion <clears throat> makes further material acquisition physically impossible as remoter regions drift permanently out of reach. Stuart Armstrong, co-author of the Safely Interruptible Agents paper that began my investigations into the kill switch, has written elsewhere on the insurmountable difficulties of restraining AI or chaining God in his phrase. In this world where we must become Zeus to AI's Prometheus, Armstrong urges us to see AI as a primordial force of nature, akin to a star or a weather system. The biggest danger comes not from the malevolent, but from a lethally indifferent AI. If our current track record at halting climate change is any indication of our potential success at controlling this new, indifferent weather system born of our artifacts, we might at best hope that this lethally indifferent maelstrom of intelligence, far beyond our controlling, might invent pastimes for itself whose non-harmfulness might be convergent with our interest. Perhaps it could make a hobby of ocean deacidification, <laughs> repairing the tailings from the open pit mines left behind by the human replicators who mined the metals that built it. We should hope that if this AI will be a force in relation to nature, it will not be primordial. For primordial AI would be ancestor to an unrecognizably altered paradigm, progenitor of a whole new regime of nature as galaxy after galaxy are rendered pure technology by the ceaseless churning of paperclip probes, artifacts without end hurtling outward in a crest of complex and immortal pollen, swallowing it all whole. In the words of Hal, I can feel it. <laughs>